we like to call it the supernatural hour. And now, our hosts. Hey, welcome to the Supernatural Hour podcast. I am your host, Raven. I'm Chad. This is Emmett. And this is Doc. So do you have something for the junk drawer, Raven? I do. So remember, we're we're doing kind of our Middle East troops yep. ghost series. So segment two. So segment two is um, about a soldier. He worked with special forces in Afghanistan, and he had this mission to set up a hide to survey uh, in a village that was several miles away from his location. And it was believed that there was a, a person of interest in the Taliban who was in this area, and they'd been tracking him for years. So the squad's main goal at this time was to kind of observe the village for a few days and see if there was anything suspicious going on, you know, activity or people, and just kind of collect any information that they could use later for a raid. So they had this team of six men at the base, and then they had two others, and their job uh, was to kind of creep in closer to observe the village from a little different vantage point. And things were going fine. On the second day, the, the squad began to have trouble maintaining radio contact with the observation team and the tactical operations center. And, you know, all their communications was plagued by static, and sometimes it wouldn't go through at all. And they just kind of figured, you know, we were in the Middle East, and, um, you know, we're not exactly plugging into a wall outlet. You know, we're out in the middle of nowhere. And they figured also, you know, there's some magnetic content of the rocks in the area. Some of the witnesses and some of the men actually went out to reposition, um, you know, some of their equipment so they could get a better signal. And as they were doing this one evening, right around dusk, one of the soldiers said he saw a man wearing a white robe who seemed to be kind of darting and running in and out between the rocks outside the village. And so, you know, I mean, this is what they're looking for. They're looking for suspicious activity. So, you know, they notice it. I'm just going to read their report. Their report. It says, there was something odd about the way he described it, but we were more worried about being compromised. Needless to say, we folded up our crap and got ready to move out. We weren't going to end up in some lone survivor type clusterfuck. Can I say that? We were the heck out of there. So at this point, it's late dusk, and we were moving pretty quick. Everyone is on Cl- a cluster fetch. A cluster fetch, yeah. We're, we're yeah. from Utah. So everyone is on high fetching alert, and we are a small element in a remote area without ready access to any kind of quick reaction force, and we had no reliable communication. They're, you know, they're retreating back to their outpost just as fast as they can. So the witnesses of this thing uh, took up the rear. They're walking backwards and making sure they're not being followed or leaving a clear trail. And uh, this fellow had his gun trained on the dark area behind him this whole time. You know, because he's like, if something comes for me, it's, you know, I'm taking it out. He said that he did spot this, a glimpse of something white moving in the distance, but he couldn't be sure of what it was or if it was following them. And he says, oddly, he would later report at the time he began to smell um, freshly baked bread. And there's no reason there should be freshly baked bread at this time of, of the day or this time of the evening. And he said, considering what they were doing and they were afraid it was, you know, enemies following them, um, after he would smell the freshly, freshly baked bread, then he had a sudden onset of a feeling of peace and relaxation. Um, and he says, it wasn't just me. He said, you could actually, this feeling was actually coming from where the same direction that the smell was coming from and the same direction as the white figure. It wasn't Mm. just kind of an overall piece. He says it was very directional. Um, He says the sensation was so profound that he actually slowed down. And he says he had thoughts that danced through his head of running to this comfortable place he felt pulling at him where they had been. So it's like, was what was happening, was it something that was actually peaceful, saying you're going to be okay? Or was it kind of like a siren? You know, was it a a bad entity trying to Something make it? Something lure him in? Trying to lure him in. Um, he says he kind of shook off this daze, reported to the other men what he had seen and what he felt. And he's, you know, he says, I think I'm being, we're being followed. Um, and an officer said that he had seen something white moving as well. And the, the witness said, I asked my dudes to keep their eyes open for anything because I thought I had seen someone trailing us. 
Our senior scout piped in, that's strange, ma- Mom. He said, his name was Mom. He says, I, I was Mom. Long story. I thought it was some dude in white on the ridge in front of us. At this point, all the hairs on my neck are standing up. Everything felt strange. The air felt heavy and sort of sweet. The silence hummed loudly. You know, night time's moving and it's getting dark, so they're, they're having this sense of urgency and panic because they don't want to be out there in the dark in a you know, strange area with, with someone. And they've got dread going on. Um, they'd been exhausted from just their long day of hauling around heavy equipment and getting everything ready. So, you know, darkness comes in. They're kind of enveloped in just pitch black. So they have to put their night vision goggles on. And, you know, when you put night vision goggles on, not that I have ever really had them on, but it makes everything green, right? Mm -hmm. So there's like this green haze. They said the night was just silent. And they said it was more silent than usual. No movement um, out there. He says, you know, there's, you know, kind of mountainous, a moonscape almost is how he described it. That's just kind of bathed in this green night vision mist, you think, you know, just green, right? But they said the eerie silence would not last. And they said this is when it got really, really strange. And again, I'm just going to read it. It says, hallucinations happened, but what happened was beyond comprehension. First, we heard a sound like a huge airplane taking off a loud low buzz that slowly increased in pitch. We had to yell over comms to hear each other. Everywhere I looked, I kept seeing what looked like glowing eyes staring back at me. But once I would center my focus on where I saw them, they would disappear. We were fetching panicked. Everyone was holding their rifles high in the ready. We were expecting some kind of ambush attack. And we started talking out the RP we would meet. We would need to start a peel and move. That's some army talk that I don't know. Then it all just stopped. Everything got dark. The only thing I could hear was my breath and the blood pumping in my head. We stopped, dug into the side of the mountain, and performed SLLS, which is stop, look, listen, smell, for about 10 minutes. Nothing, not even bugs. The air and land were silent. And they they said they saw absolutely nothing. You know, it wasn't actually an airplane because they would have seen it in their night vision. And they said nothing. So they're confused, they're scared, they're tired. They resume their trudge through the wilderness back to camp. They're very aware that there is something malignant and beyond their experience out there. They don't know what it is, but it's like, that's some creepy stuff. Then suddenly they notice kind of on a a parallel hillside, a very clear sight of a man dressed in light colored robes. And he seemed to be making his way towards them very slowly. But they said it wasn't like a man, you know, they're out there with rocks on this moonscape and he's not like stepping over rocks or around things. They said it just seemed like the stranger was just passing through any obstacle that he came upon. And they just said it was really surreal. It said he seemed to melt over and around the rocks. It was effing unnatural the way he was moving. Through the night vision goggles, his eyes glowed. The witness says, I scoped up on him and saw he was looking directly at me. It was pitch black. There's no way he could have seen us from that distance without any kind of night optics. Suddenly he stopped. He picked up one of his limbs and held it in the air, almost like he was waving at me. Then the arm melted back into his form like it wasn't an arm at all, but some sort of extendable proboscis that was meant to look like an arm from a distance. I was about to ask the guys if they could see him when he suddenly disappeared. So this witness says he also saw some flickering in the distance near the town, which he kind of presumed to be, you know, just the area, or the enemies closing in on their area, and then where the area that the sound booming had originated. They made it back to their, you know, their their base, and they went on just to tell their strange experiences and reportedly told that it was probably all attributable to, you know, being tired and and adrenaline. And And so they kind of forgot about it until a few days later, but then it took kind of a weird turn. And this weird turn says the reason we did the observation was so we could bring back intelligence for a raid that was to be conducted. The raid was successful in the sense that finding a deer hit by the car is a successful deer hunt. Um, apparently the team that moved into the village found it completely abandoned. They also found several men in the area where I had seen the lights the night we were hauling ass out of there. The corpses had been ripped to shreds and based on the sheer amount of blood, the general consensus was, was that there were more men that were killed than there were bodies found. 
it went in the official record as a successful raid with several enemy um, killed in actions. Unofficially, no one had any idea what killed them. All I know is that whatever it was, it chose. It chose those men and not us. Do, 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 do. That's kind of wow. weird. Yep. So there you go. And whatever it was remains unknown. Wow. So I'm almost wondering, just you know, as I as I read that story, it's like the the man in white that they saw, and the the peaceful feeling was that like a guardian angel, you know, a protective a spirit protective so. spirit that's telling them you're going to be fine, you're going to hear some creepy stuff, you're going to be okay, because they had a very different experience than the people that were ripped to shreds in the village. Mm-hmm. Mm. So residentials, we had a residential, what was it, just yesterday? Saturday. Saturday. So yeah, we're, so we're courting on Monday. So this was just two days ago. And this was... I can't wait to hear about this because oh. it was close, but I was just in too much pain to make it. It was so close to you. I actually have some stuff that, um, that Velma gave to me in Virginia City to bring to you and your wife for your birthdays. And I was going <laughs> to bring it and I forgot. That's, I'll, I'll see you soon. Uh, no anyway, sorry. So this residential, um, the lady reached out to me through email. And it was interesting because she said, I'm being just attacked so heavily that I can't even email you from my house. She says, I mean, anytime I try to email you, I get sick. I get a headache. Um, the computers won't work. She literally had to leave the house to be able to get an email through to me. You know, we schedule it. The day of the residential I get an email from, or a text from her, and she says, I actually ended up in the hospital. She said, so my mother will be there. My mother will let you in. She said, my mom knows all about, you know, the what's and the where's, and, and she can walk you through it. So I said, okay. You know, I said, I hope you get feeling better. She said, me too. When we get to the house, her mom's there, a very, very nice lady. And um, she said that there were places in the house where they felt and saw a very dark presence, um, the mom had actually gotten choked in her sleep. Yeah, the mom wouldn't even stay there. She, when she's in town, up from St. George, they book a bed and breakfast. She stays at the bed and breakfast because she won't even stay at the house. Yeah, and there's plenty of room for her to stay there. Well, house it sounds like at to. least she's she must be sensitive. Yeah, I think, think so. Yeah, yes. and the mother's sensitive. Because she can and, see things. And so are the kids. And so um, it was... And when I say kids, I mean adults. Adult yeah, kids, her, yeah. her children. So it's it's actually her daughter and the daughter's wife. And then there's a, is it their child? Did they have it? There's a, there's a child that is there. I think so, yeah. I don't know if it's their child or if it's like their little sister. Um, Dark Presence, there's a couple rooms that they do not like going into. There was a second entity that liked, or that didn't seem to bother the daughter, but really didn't like the daughter's wife. What else was going on? Oh, fish had died. The dead birds. Dead birds out in the backyard all the time. And they'd found them under when they, they moved in about two years ago and they did a renovation of the place and a lot of things. They found dead birds in under the cabinets in the kitchen. They redid all of the wiring. The, the gal is a, like an IT specialist and when she moved in she knew she needed to have good electrical thing. The house was probably built, I would say probably in the 60s or 70s. Mm -hmm. and, and the mom said that they spent $15,000 rewiring the house. Yeah, and you, you could see they redid like all of the, the lights in the ceilings, you know, everything's updated. It was a very, it was a very nice home, the way it was decorated and oh yeah, no, they, very modern. You know, when you say, you think of a 1960s homes, you can kind of think sometimes that kind of a dated older home that needs a, a power update you know, because they might not have the service, but that, that wasn't the case. All right. So we started downstairs in, in the office and I turned the light on and the light came on really dim and then it started to flash. And I actually have a video of this. I videoed it, started to flash. And I looked at the mother and I said, is this normal? And she said, no. And that was about the point where she said, they just spent $15,000 rewiring this whole house. Everything should work perfectly. So I turned it off waited for a second, turned it back on, and then it just came on like it was supposed to. So I flipped it back off and on a couple times, and it we couldn't get it to flash again. Mm. We did an investigation down there. There was a Type 3, and we had Ethan with us, and Ethan can actually see things. 
And he said, yeah, I see the type 3. She's manifesting as female with no legs. So we chatted with her for a little while. You gave her the name Paula? We named her Paula. So and the tell them a little bit about why we name and what we do. So we named her Paula because that name actually came up on Skylar's app. Okay. And she doesn't like the name. We said, well, then don't make it pop up on the app. And again, sometimes when we use that word app, sometimes it's like that word has not relevant to anything. You know, Q-tip, big deal. You know, but sometimes you just get things that just are super relevant and not just one or two things because that could be coincidence, but it was just thing after thing after thing. after. Th- I mean, almost, I bet you 90% of the words were relevant right when we said it. We give these demonic entities just regular names. We don't give them scary names because that gives them power. But Ethan said, yeah, she's manifesting as a woman, doesn't have any legs. She kept touching me and Skylar. We kept telling her to stop and she kept doing it. That we also found a child spirit there, a boy, blonde boy, about 10, and his older brother. Older brother was grumpy, but not like mean grumpy. He was like overprotective. Like teenage angst, overprotective grumpy? Yeah, like a teenager trying to take care of his little brother and uh, I don't know. Trying um, to be a little tough. Mm-hmm. It was the little boy. The little boy liked the daughter, did not like her wife for some reason. So, and when you say the daughter, you mean... So the homeowner. Yeah, the homeowner itself, right. Yeah, so the homeowner li- was fine with the homeowner, did not like the homeowner's wife. So it's like, okay, well, that answers one question. Because she actually changed offices because she felt so uncomfortable in the office that she was in. She had to switch. So then we went upstairs, and we went into this other office. Um, this other office had been a bedroom. It's where the mom um, of the homeowner had gotten choked. And it's where she saw this dark shadow. And there was a type 3 in there, and that type 3 manifested as a bear. That's kind of weird, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Manifested as a bear. So we were upstairs investigating for probably another half hour, 45 minutes. And we ran back downstairs after about 45 minutes because I thought, I wonder if that light downstairs flickers if it's been off for a long time. And it didn't. It just came right on. There was no... So you only had the flickering when you first went in. When we first went in there. So going back up to where the bear was, Ethan could also see like two or three little type threes that we just called gnomes. You know, he says they're only like you know a foot or two up off the floor. So we just called them gnomes. Was anybody feeling a Native American vibe at all? Oh, we will get to that. <laughs> uh-huh. You must be. You are. <laughs> the homeowner was half Native American. Mm-hmm. And the mom just happened to kind of mention that. I don't. She mentioned that to me when I, I was interviewing her during the investigation. Okay. I mean, talking with her about well, and things I, yeah, that had happened. And I think she mentioned it before we investigated, too. Because okay. I remember hearing her say it as well. Just with the nature of a couple of things, we, we felt like we needed to call Newman and have him check out a couple of things. So, one of the questions we asked, and this was interesting because we always tried to find out. If we can, why a type 3 is going to target a family? Because if there's a reason there, you know, sometimes we can talk the reason through. For example, you know, if you're drinking a little heavy and you're going to bed drunk every night, that's going to be a weak point because you you have lost, you know, you're not on top of your game. And these kind of entities are going to find that little chink in your armor to attack. And so through a bunch of yes-no questions... The answers that came out were that this uh, demonic entity identified as a female. I mean, I don't know how they work. Most of the ones we run into kind of manifest as as male. Lucy. I mean, Mm -hmm. we've got others. There's Lucy, and then there's this Paula. But I think those are the only two that I've really run into that have been female. Well, she just did not like the fact that this was a lesbian couple. It, It rankled her hide. And she kind of banked on the fact that it that the LGBT thing can be a little controversial. And she just, she kind of ran with that. Worked on that. Mm-hmm. She worked on that. So we called Newman. One thing real quick. We talked briefly about the other type th- threes that were there, that you said they're gnome-like. Yes. Okay, and w- one of the things that you had determined is they were almost like in training. Is that correct? Yes, and that was, a, we were kind of asking why they were there and what they were doing. And the word training popped up. 
on Skylar's Word app, mm-hmm. and you know, through some yes no questions, yes, they were they were there being trained. Paula was training them. And, and it's interesting because we identify them, and we have kind of these lower level type threes that aren't really powerful, but sometimes want to project bigger than they are. You know, we kind of routinely reference them as kind of a gnome, mm-hmm. kind of a little thing. And we were, but we told the the mother uh, of the homeowner this about it, and she turns and points right down, and she's got a whole gnome village right there in the living room, which was kind oh, of interesting wow. that they had. Well, and what she said, the, the mom said, she pointed to it, and it was like little miniatures, mm-hmm. right? I mean, the mushrooms were probably, you know, a half an inch tall, and it was it was gorgeous. It was a very beautiful little diorama. And there's beetle juice right in the middle of it. <laughs> <laughs> and the mother said, you know, my daughter started doing the this gnome um, you know, she didn't say diorama, but diorama. And she says, we have no idea why she started doing that. You know, because I said, you know, as soon as I said, oh, they're just little gnome-likes, I mean, her eyes just widened open, you know. So that was kind of interesting. So if you haven't heard of Newman before, um, if you've just started listening to us, he's a medium that uh, we work with on occasion. Um, if there's something that we don't feel like we can handle or to check and make sure we got everything out. Cause he can We've been giving him a workout lately. We have. Um, we can get a hold of him remote. I mean, he can come in remotely and do some stuff. And the interesting thing is when I call him, I always say roughly the same thing. I give him zero information. I usually call and say, hey, Newman, we're at a home. We're dealing with a, a spirit that's a little tricky. We need you to help us. I mean, and that's about the that's extent of what I say. That's pretty much it. Yep. I've seen him do it. He'll just sit there and just nail it, thing after thing after thing that you didn't even tell him. Right. And this is in front of, in this case, the homeowner's mother and us other investigators. We're, we're sitting there in, in the front room while you're making this call. Yeah. And I always put it on speakerphone so that everybody can hear. And it's interesting because when he talks about demonic entities, he always refers to them as he. Always. And so, I mean, I do too because... Most of the time, ninety-nine percent of the time, they they come through as masculine, right? But it was interesting. I didn't tell him it was a a female demonic. And when I mentioned it to the homeowner, we said, "Yeah, she's manifesting without legs. Her eyes got big again, and she's like, I only see it from the waist up when I see it." But Newman kept. He'd say he, and then he'd kind of stop and he'd go it, and he's never done that before. So I could I could tell that he was kind of zoning in that it was female and so you know he cleared a few things and the child spirit and the and his kind of semi-grumpy big brother newman didn't mention them and i just got the feeling that when he was crossing some of these other things they just kind of hopped on board and crossed along with and when newman hung up we actually you know through the dowsing rods asked if they were still there and the answer was no and charles my spirit guy said no they they crossed but everything else crossed you can tell after after crossings and clearings that you know just the whole atmosphere in these houses is, is just lighter. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You know he he cleared a few things and then he mentioned to the to the mother. He says yeah and you know blah 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 mentioned about the illnesses and I didn't say people were getting sick. He could just tell that. And then he did a kind of a, a clearing slash blessing on the property. And you could hear him, sometimes you can hear him mutter and it doesn't really make sense, but you could hear him kind of muttering this time and it was clear. I didn't understand it, but it was Native American. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've never heard him mutter Native American before. And it's like, well, that's interesting because she's half Native American. Um, He's like, and he even said, he's like, I don't know why my Native American spirit guide came through. That was really weird. And we're like, "Uh, actually. Yeah, the mother's eyes kind of brightened up when, when he started speaking in that prayer in the in Native the American dialect, dialect that yeah. he was speaking. And she is Native American, but Native American from South America. She's white Anglo Indi- and and like Mayan or something. I mean, you know, way But south. she does have an indigenous uh, heritage. Yeah, but it's, and, and there's a lot of European in there. She, you know, she, you could look at her and say, she's got, you know, an, an exotic look. But, oh, okay. you know, it wasn't like, wow, she's really ethnic. I didn't, that didn't come across to me. But she married a, a Native American. And so the child was well more than half truly ma- Native American, her, yeah. her daughter. So I just found it interesting that um, Newman's 
Native American spirit guide came through because it's like that's going to resonate with the family, and he did not know that. Yep. Which I think is fascinating. Yeah. In fact, well, I just when you were talking, I felt I felt something indigenous was might have might have been a play there. Oh yeah. So yeah, wow, that's fa- neat. When when Newman got done and was pretty much, I I did mention to him and I said just Newman just so that you know, you know the the owner the homeowner is you know more than half native american and he you know he was a little surprised wasn't he yeah he was like oh yeah what else oh he asked if if the home was near a body of water and it was there's a big pond and then right behind the homeowner there's this huge fish tank and she said you know our fish keep dying yeah and it was probably like a 200 gallon tank it's a big tank it was a big big tank so and then we had already determined that there was a negative portal out by the shed um, and they did mention that they felt really creepy when they went out by the shed, and it was the energy from the negative portal that was killing the birds. Hmm. So Newman closed that. Um, anyway, all in all, it was a very, it's probably one of the most interesting investigations I've been on in a while. Mm-hmm. Very active, very, you know, very interesting, especially with the illnesses and, and the daughter actually at the hospital. In fact, she had been... Um, her mother had said that they thought they were going to bring her home that day, and she had got ill again that morning. Well, the interesting thing is they said every time they tried to call us or or something, they would they would get sick. <laughs> and, and we hear that all the time. It's like, yeah, I, you know, when people that call us, if they've got something nasty in their house, the energy always kind of kicks up and, and gets worse when they yep, try to they contact. Yeah, they don't, don't want you coming over. Yeah, and the mother did say she could feel a real difference in the home as we were leaving. Yep. Yeah, and she sent me a text later, and she said, I'm not scared to be in the house. Excellent. So it was a good investigation. We did not mention that Vivian was there. I do want to give her credit for for being there. Yeah, when she walked in, she got there a little bit late. uh, And when she walked in, she introduced herself to, to the mother. And she she just zoned in immediately on that back room, that office area, that same area where the mother said that, you know, she had got choked out and that Vivian, that was the first thing. Oh yeah. She I just was just drawn right there. I think we all just it was so heavy in there. I think we were all just pulled back there. So by next podcast we should have two residentials. Uh, a residential and a half to talk about. So the half we're a residential and a half? Yeah, so we actually have one scheduled to go to a home and do an investigation. The other one is a lady that wants to talk to us. Um, and just the nature of some of the stuff, I thought I'd rather meet at a neutral location to chat with mm. her first. Okay. So we're just going to we're going to meet at a library and just chat before we determine what we're going to do. So I that, thought you were going to talk another legless spirit. That's why it would be half uh-huh. investigation. Well, and just if you're new to the paranormal or, or new listening to us, if it's a demonic entity, demonic entities can form a human, but there's always going to be um, something missing. Always. They're going to be missing a foot or eyes. I mean, Lucy doesn't have eyes um, or an ear. I mean, they, they cannot form a perfect human body. There's always going to be a flaw. So in the case of Paula, she couldn't form legs. Interesting. All right, Emmett, do you have you have a you have a thing to talk to us about? Well, yeah, it's um, <clears throat> I was watching uh, Kindred Spirits the other night, and I noticed Adam had this tiny little SLS camera. It was basically a phone and a teeny little projector. It looked like a a scale model of the Xbox projector, you know. And uh, we love those things. We haul them around, but boy, they get heavy after a while. You know, it's easily the probably one of the heaviest pieces of gear. So when I saw him with that, I started looking into it, and it turns out that um, there's some uh, apps you can you can download for your phone that will mimic the the SLS camera. Now I've downloaded one to my phone. It's a recent model, you know, Android Galaxy. But your phone has to have lidar, okay? If it doesn't have lidar, this thing now on mine it just picks up false hits everywhere but you can tell on your phone look on the back where you've got uh, the lenses and there should be a small black dot 
okay, near there. It's probably about the same size as the light for your flash or your flashlight. But if you have that black dot, then your phone has uh, onboard LiDAR and you can use one of these uh, SLS phone apps and it will work just <gasps> like the real Connect. I have it. And mine does too. Does yours? Okay. Do you have iPhones? Yes. No, I That's have a Galaxy. Why. Okay. The, but it's a newer it's one. Only, yeah, only the recent models. I think uh, you have to have iPhone 14 or newer and or higher and uh, and only the recent Galaxies. That, uh, and I don't have one yet, so I can't vouch for that. So next time I see you guys, we're going to try that out on yours. Okay. See what we get. Now, now did I'm you also... Do did you Go do ahead. some experiments with the phone you have? Yeah, and I could not get my, you know, I have two other SLS cameras, uh, both versions, one and two, and I couldn't get either one of those to verify anything that was coming up on my phone. Okay. They were just, then the phone seemed to be very confused by um, busy backgrounds. It would start to show you more, just mapping stuff out, I guess, just uh, based on a busy background and something floating in front of you. So I have that app, and I've used it once or twice, but not enough to really be helpful in this conversation. <laughs> is, is that the Ghost uh, Ghost Tube SLS app? I think so. So next time I go on a residential, which I think is my next thing coming up. Um, Let's compare. Yeah, I have actually used, I've got the Ghost app, the Ghost Tube SLS, and I've, I've used it with quite a bit of success. In fact, one of our um, patrons... And she was at the Petite Neat School the first time that I saw this. She had it on her phone. And she also had it at, um, I think the first time I saw someone else use it was at the Hub Theater. Okay. And they got some, some really good evidence at, at the Hub Theater. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I have seen it um, ev as evidence from someone else, and it seemed to be pretty good. You know, I mean, the way you described it um, in some of the texts, Emma, it was that the backgrounds, you know, weren't picking up and, you know, it was busy and you were getting what you felt were a lot of false hits. But yeah, then you, you don't have the LiDAR. Stuff in. Yeah, you don't have the LiDAR if that's happening. Yeah. But, there, you know, there's another alternative, too. I discovered that uh, if you go to Microsoft products uh, page, they actually sell something called the, uh, the Azure uh, Connect camera. And it's, it's not really a product that they're selling commercially it's it's a developer's kit and it's a, it's several hundred dollars but it's basically a a, a miniaturized version of the, of the xbox camera that you know we use on these home built systems that we've been using so that's, that's kind of cool yeah so i just i like the direction that the whole sls camera uh, is taking uh getting smaller and easier to carry because honestly that that thing it's very heavy when you've packed it around for 40 minutes. Yes, and I've noticed that I don't use mine as often as I would like. Because um, it's a pain in the butt, right? Yeah. And, and then the batteries go very quickly yeah, on it, too. The batteries go very fast. And the other thing is I'm usually uh, having to song and dance. And lead groups. And lead groups. And so, yeah. I mean, if, I, if I'm just doing something by myself, I'll use it a little bit more. I mean, Skylar, right now you and Skylar are kind of our SLS guys. So, and I mean, I don't even use it as much as I used to, you know, yes. if I'm leading a group, I'll, I'll pick some volunteer who's really gung ho and let them carry it around. And yes. <laughs> yeah. Find a mule. 15 minutes later, the battery is dead. You're like, well, yep. that was fun. Yeah. So I would like to test out the one on my phone because I would probably use it more. I just kind of forget about it. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's all I got. All right. Well, thank you. You bet. And I would love to tell you that it's going to be kind of warm and maybe we'll go outside, but today is March 27th and it snowed like six inches up at the University of Utah that I got to trudge in. Trudge. I trudged. You trudged through I'm the snow? So I, love, I love winter. I really do. I love winter. But I am so over winter right now. I'm done. So how many inches at Snowbird? Oh, no. We don't talk about inches. We talk. It's Alta. They have 62 feet. And after today, I bet you they have 63 or 64 feet. <laughs> feet of snow. That's There are buildings that are not that tall, folks. A lot of buildings aren't that tall. <laughs> I think, is it on the Delta Center? They've got like a sticker on the side of the, like a big, 
I don't know what they call those, a big thing on the side of the Delta Center that shows how deep the snow is. Some kind of a graph or, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. I'm done with winter, folks. But we're glad to have the snow. We need it for the reservoirs. and. Yes. Oh, let me tell you that, okay, this has nothing to do with the paranormal, but I think you'll all find it interesting. I ran into a a classmate um, on the train, and bless this classmate's heart, we're talking about the weather, because we only knew each other in class, and it was one of those awkward, you make eye contact, so you feel like you need to say something, right? So we talked about the weather. And I said, yeah, yeah, I love snow, but it would be nice if the temperature bumped up like 40 degrees and it rained. And this individual said to me, oh, but rain, rain causes flooding. And I'm thinking, so does 62 feet of snow when it melts, Buster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway. especially, if it, gets hot, time. especially yep. if it gets hot all at once, yeah, so which we tend to do. So I thought, okay, yeah. The business has been brought to you by Castle Photo Art and Castle Nature Studio. We have one more little tidbit of business. We do? It's a teaser. Um, we don't have anything set in stone yet, but we do have kind of a, an apps road trip. Um, later in the summer, we just have to confirm some dates before we want to give out too many details. But, I mean, everything will be, you have to get there by yourself, you have to pay for your own hotel room, you got to pay for your own food and your own gas, but you can buy a ticket to come and, and investigate with us. Um, we will have details for that as soon as we can, but we're looking at end of and and uh, mid mid August roughly tentatively right now. So stay tuned because it will be fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. Very very neat venue. We've talked about it on previous podcasts, and Raven and I have been there before, and we wish that we would have known more about it when we went there the first time. Yes, but anyway, so let us get some things confirmed. Um, some dates confirmed, and we will hopefully by the next podcast we'll be able to. So save up a little money for the hotel room and the and food and, and if you're food and gas. If you uh, live in Utah or like Nevada, it's not going to be uh, too big of a stretch for you. So, All right. okay. So Castle Photo Art and Castle Nature Studio—they're the people that brought us the business today. All righty. And I thought that was a good episode. I learned a lot. But then I always do. All right. Well, stay spooky, my haunty friends. Hey, have a good night, everybody. We'll see you next time. Have a good one, everyone. You've been listening to the Supernatural Hour at AdvancedParanormal.com. The Supernatural Hour is part of the Radio Ronin Network found at RadioRonin.com. Copyright by Advanced Paranormal Services. In the dead of night, as people sleep, that is when the spirits creep. As the bell tolls three, dark things take power. We like to call it the supernatural hour.